Well, welcome here this morning, Ian. I'm absolutely delighted you've given the time up to have a quick chat with us. It's just a... Great. It's nice to be with you. I've got my coffee with me, my favourite mug. That's brilliant. Thank you. And it's lovely to see your study background as well. We can picture where you work now. So I'm Louisa, editor of Preach Magazine, and Ian Paul is also an editor. He works at managing editor of Grove Books. That's right. And a theologian and a assistant pastor. Associate, associate minister in my church, yeah. Associate minister. Yep. And also the um, way you might know him most, um, most about him is from the blog he runs, which mm. I will let Ian introduce. This is called Sefidzo. But you don't, that's, that's difficult to spell. So if people want to find me, just search for Ian Paul blog and you'll find it straight away. So and what, what does the name mean? Ian? Well, Sefidzo is the Greek word for to calculate or to, uh, or to, can be used for to vote. And it's using in modern Greek for that. Um, and it comes from the Greek word sephos, meaning a pebble, because in the ancient world, when you counted or when you voted, you actually used a pebble. Um, but it's, it's pretty imp it's important for a number of reasons. One is that one of my favorite verses in the Bible is Revelation 13, 18, uh, which is about the mark of the beast. And it says, uh, for anyone who has wisdom, uh, they should calculate the number of the beast. Sefidso is the verb there. And interestingly, it surprises people to learn that we're told we should calculate it. You see often commentators saying we shouldn't calculate it. It's not a code. Well, it is. And John wants us to work it out. Um, but it, there's a sense in which as well, for me, it's about working things out. My background is in pure mathematics and in business. And mm -hmm. when I came to theology, one of the things I noticed was that sometimes in theology there's a lot of sloppy thinking and sometimes you need to actually ask some hard questions and actually do a bit of work and work things out. And, and I suppose my conviction is, and I say this on the, on, the, on the blog in the about section, I said my conviction is that actually the Christian faith does all add up, pun intended, it does actually make sense and uh, you don't have to park your brain somewhere else when you actually you know commit to faith in jesus and and, and join a church and, and follow him so absolutely it, it, it it's head sense. and heart isn't it is it? Uh, yeah quite and yeah. created yeah. in god's image we have a yeah. modicum of his intelligence and curiosity about the well, world as paul says you know we have the mind of christ by the spirit yeah. so <laughs> amazing that's, that's quite a claim yeah it is it is it is quite a claim well that is partly the reason why i invited you to be a contributor you're a columnist mm. preach magazine and um, for those listening in, Ian writes the column at the back of the magazine called Word of God. So Ian takes the theme of the magazine and then I invited him in 750 words only. That's a, that's a tough brief. A tough, <laughs> really tough brief, but it's bigger than that because um, we've also invited him to draw on his knowledge of Hebrew and Greek, which he's just explained to everybody. Um, is quite in depth and um, to use that to look at that particular word yes. across the whole of the Bible yeah. from yeah. the Old Testament through to New Testament and, and I it's been it's been a great fun exercise I've really I've enjoyed the challenge actually so thank you for the invitation it's been really wonderful to read what you've come up with mm. um, explain a little bit about why you you find it interesting and challenging to do the column ah well now there's a tale I think um <laughs> it's interesting isn't it um there's a, there's a thing in maths called a fractal. And a fractal is a pattern where if you look at one little bit of it, what you see is actually the pattern of the whole. Uh, so you see a big picture, but then you, when you look down to the detail, the detail looks the same. And I find that that happens when I look at these themes and these words. When you begin to drill down on a particular idea and you look at it through scripture, you, you often get the whole picture as well, the, 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 the big picture. Um, sorry, excuse me in the background, that's Barney the dog who's uh, welcoming the postman or somebody. That is your dog and not my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I found really interesting is that just looking at these words and, 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 and tracing a theme through scripture, it addresses what I think are some of the key issues in the struggles people have with reading scripture these days. And I think I observed three kinds of dynamics going on. One of the dynamics is just our failure to pay attention, our failure to slow down and to look at what scripture says and I think the reason for that is that we're in a very different cultural context than the writers of scripture were in the in the old testament and in the first century in the new testament they lived in a world with few written words 
Mm. We live in a world where we are overwhelmed with a tsunami of words, whether that's on the internet, whether that's in books, whether that's in newspapers or magazines or whatever. Mm. And, and what that means is that we're very good at racing through. And, you know, you can, you can sign up for a course on speed reading, mm. skimming through things, seeing, summarizing things without looking too much at the detail. When we read scripture, we need to do the opposite. We need to slow down. One of, one of my favorite books I've got on my shelf is called How to Read More Slowly. Mm. And one of the things I find is that as I read scripture slowly, by the way, it's a really good reason for, for anybody to have a go at learning Hebrew and Greek, because what that does when you're reading another language or if you speak another language, if you speak French or Spanish or German or whatever, buy a Bible in that other language, because what it forces you to do is to slow down and to say, well, hang on, what's this word mean? What does this word, what does this word mean? Mm. And I find my experience quite often is that when I'm teaching and teaching context, I say to people, look, the text says this and they go, oh, no, it doesn't. I go, oh, yes, it does. And we read it together and they go, oh, it does. How, how did I never see that before? Oh. We, we often impose our own meaning because we just haven't slowed down enough to see what, what the text actually says. So that's one thing we have. The second challenge we're faced with and this might sound quite philosophical but it actually affects the whole of culture and that is we've lost confidence that words mean anything mm. um there's a there's a there's a philosophical tendency in kind of what our postmodern culture is just to say that well words are plastic words mean what the reader makes them mean mm. yeah. and we find that all the time on twitter you know somebody says something on twitter and somebody else takes offense at it because for them it means x regardless yeah. of what the, the person who wrote it actually intended it to mean in its context and um this is pretty important because if if words don't mean anything if words mean what the reader thinks they mean rather than what the author thinks they mean god can't speak to us mm. because if if god wants to say something if, if god wants to communicate to us through scripture mm. then the words must mean something and I'm confident they do. And there's a philosophical argument there, but there's also a, a, an argument simply looking at the text. And you can see how mm. the words and, and phrases mean something. So those are two tendencies. I think there's also a smaller tendency within the church, which is to, to, to believe that it's important to look at words, to believe that words mean something, but then actually to detach them from their context or detach them from their wider place mm. in scripture. And yeah. I think one of the things that you challenged me to do in saying, what does all of scripture say about this particular issue? Mm -hmm. uh, you've challenged me to say, OK, let's read through the narrative and see how a concept or an idea or a word actually follows through in the, the whole of the narrative and see it in its context and see how the different parts interrelate to one another into a whole. And I, and I think some really interesting things come out. Well, I hope they do anyway. I hope you found it. I love it. I love what you write. I'm always excited to read it. And uh, it always um, holds together so well. It's definitely under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's a kind of sound bite of big themes in literature and drawing on your Bible knowledge in both languages as well. Well, I'm encouraged that you feel that. I think, yeah. again, one of the one of the, the things I'm convinced about in, in biblical studies academically, there's a movement called the theological interpretation of scripture so that we don't just take words atomistically or sort of mechanically mm. but but we see that scripture has a purpose behind it which is that god intends he god god speaks to us in scripture we can hear what he says and um it makes there has a theological coherence to it despite the variety and the variation of context and theme and even the variation which various ways that language is used in different parts of scripture it is a diverse library nevertheless the, the thing that holds scripture together is God's intention, God's theological intention to form his people faithfully to worship him and to live out his life in the world by the power of his spirit. So, so yeah, I, I, that's also one of my, one of my aims is to, is to listen to what, in, in Gordon Fee's word, hear what the spirit is saying through the text. And it seems to me that the more carefully we attend to the text, actually, the more we can be open to what the spirit is saying to us. Very exciting. That is a great summary. And um, there's so much more, you know, we could say about that. But basically, it's an invitation, really. Um, Ian's column and Ian's blog is a real invitation to us to engage with scripture as a living, breathing here and mm. now mm. word from God that, that we are invited to engage with and learn from. It's not static or fixed. And I think these words that um, are pulled out in Preach magazine and that Ian then identifies and ties to scripture are really important and um, they should be accessible to us. We shouldn't yeah. be afraid of it. Can I just qualify that? You say they shouldn't be fixed. In a sense, they should. If words mean something, they should. I think perhaps a helpful way of saying is that the way that the spirit speaks to us through scripture is tethered. <laughs> so yeah. 
we can't just make it mean anything but it, it's that there is an original meaning and then how that applies to us is is always related to that and i think my, my conviction is that if we're going to hear god speaking to us today we have to first go on a journey and sometimes it's quite a strong cross-cultural journey into the world of scripture to hear what god said then and then so we and through that we can hear what god is saying to us now through what he said to uh, yes. the people of faith before I think what I mean by not being fixed is that the um, the the that it's in terms of how we interpret it, not fixed in specific. Yeah, terms. yeah. There's always there's always new application and new context. And yeah, and we're invited to debate the meaning yeah. of those words it, yeah. in understanding yeah. the original context. But pulling it is, it yeah, it is because scripture isn't an object. Mm. <laughs> Again, so one of the things I find frustrating, particularly, I think, for those who I have value my fellowship with, but those at the more conservative end of things sometimes i think are in danger of treating scripture as an object for scrutiny but mm -hmm. that's also true actually in the, in the in our tradition of biblical studies and the sort of german tradition as well that scripture is something we pick around we've got to remember that scripture is an act of communication mm -hmm. and and we need the same kind of skills for reading scripture as we do when we're communicating with the individual you know we need to be able to listen to the other person we need to treat them as other we need to take their context seriously we need to be empathetic empathy mm -hmm. i think is a, is an, a vital quality in reading scripture because we're actually we're actually overhearing god's conversation with his people in the past and we're wanting to participate in that conversation so because scripture is an act of communication it demands those personal qualities not just technical skills oh, that's brilliant and i think the blog lends itself to that beautifully because you have people um commenting and interpreting yeah. and disagreeing yeah. and with disagreeing with me <laughs> and you quite fiercely that's always a challenge <laughs> yes but that's good because you you come back you know time and time again week after week and you're there up for the debate yeah and yeah. It's, it's really really valuable yeah and, and again it's a reminder that scripture is given not to us as an individuals but the scripture is god's gift to us as a church as a people yeah. uh, and therefore we need to be listening to one another and being open and debating you know somebody said to me on the blog yesterday well you're completely wrong and i said well uh, you're you're free to say that but you're going to need to provide some evidence for the text to persuade me that i'm wrong i'm open i'm open to persuasion i've you know i've been persuaded in the past but you know again coming back to the book of revelation i uh, i revelation has the answer to everything of course as you as you know louisa but um <laughs> revelation 1 verse 3 says blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are those plural who hear and keep it so the the social situation that John is envisaging is, a, is that the gathered people of God, one person is the lector to read it out because that's a specialist skill. We need specialist skills, but it's actually read out to the whole people of God who together hear what God is saying and respond to it and, and keep to it. That is wonderful. And that is a great place for us to end our discussion today. So there's lots of food for thought in that. And um, many thanks to Ian for joining us. And I hope everyone's encouraged to reread his column in Preach Magazine and to um, comment on his blog. Indeed. And, and, and thanks for the great work with the magazine. I thought the last issue, the current issue is just really, really excellent. So thanks for your work on that. Oh, thanks very much, Ian. That's great.